Welcome to this uh, Forest 500 webinar. Um, as you know, the subject is a climate wake up, uh, but businesses are failing to hear the alarm on deforestation. So that's the subject we'll be covering. Thank you very much indeed for taking part. We've got a really full house. I'm glad to see lots of people uh, tuning in for this. Um, a couple of kind of housekeeping points that I need to make for you. Um, would you. Would you please use the chat box for questions? And I promise that I will be more attentive looking at it from now on. So chat box for questions. Please use the at Forest 500 uh, to join the conversation on Twitter. So use the Forest 500 uh, hashtag. As I say, we're here to discuss progress on getting financial institutions to do more to tackle deforestation. We've got some, some great uh, speakers uh, joining us. So from Global Canopy, we've got Sarah Draper. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. We have from Forest 500 itself, Emma Thompson. Uh, the uh, MP Neil Parrish has joined yes. us. Thank you very much, Neil, for attending on what is a very busy and exciting day in the British Parliament, we have to say. Uh, we've got a member of the uh, European Parliament, Delara Burkhart. Thank you very much, Delara, for joining us too. Uh, we have, uh, representing the world of business and finance, we've got Vermund Olsen, the Senior Sustainability Analyst at Storebrand Asset Management, which, I am I right in thinking, is a Swedish company? Is that right, Vermund? Norwegian. Norwegian. Yeah, it's not, it's not. That's probably a terrible, terrible, it's like calling an American Canadian. So I'm very sorry for that slur uh, that I've just uh, inadvertently committed. And then from BNP Paribas, we have Sebastian Soliel, who is the global head of energy transition and environment. Uh, BNP Paribas uh, very uh, 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 score very highly, I should say, on the Forest 500 ranking. So it's great to have them with us. So thank you very much indeed, everybody. Um, then let's go straight into the discussion. We've got an opportunity for you guys to outline, you know, your views on this. There are a couple of points that I wanted to make right at the beginning that it has been, well, last year, 2021, with COP26, which obviously was a kind of very important meeting uh, for uh, climate issues. But we saw a couple of really major commitments there that I wouldn't mind setting up to frame the findings of the report. So we had, as people will recall, 141 countries, 90% of, of tropical forests they cover, agreeing, coming together to agree to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030. So very ambitious. Obviously, big questions about how meaningful that is, but it is good to get those kind of commitments. And I think we, you know, we, we sometimes, particularly we journalists, are, 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 are reluctant to applaud people when they uh, appear to do the right thing. So, you know, let's have, we'll be exploring, we'll be digging in and finding out what our, our panel think of how uh, serious a commitment that is. The other commitment, perhaps more relevant to this uh, webinar, is of course the 30 financial institutions uh, with an estimated $90 trillion of assets who pledged their best efforts to eliminate um, deforestation, commodity-driven deforestation from their portfolios by 2025. So that's another really ambitious um, uh, target. Um, but of course, let's, let's whiz to the, the headline of uh, the Forest 500 findings, which is that key uh, companies and financial institutions are not doing enough to tackle the problem of tropical deforestation. So why have we got this, um, this uh, disconnect? Uh, and that's uh, how I'd like to frame uh, the beginning of this uh, webinar. Why are we not doing enough, I suppose, uh, is, is the question. And let's start with Global can Canopy. Let's start with you, Sarah. Sarah, why isn't enough being done despite these great commitments that we heard at, at, uh, in Glasgow at COP26? Thanks, Justin. Yeah, I think I think I was just echo. You know, we we have seen disappointing progress this year and over the last few years from the, the companies and the financial institutions that we look at. Um, and we really need that kind of sector wide change. We do need a lot, all companies and financial institutions that are exposed to this issue to be acting to actually tackle the issue on the ground because we have seen a few leaders setting commitments and policies over the last ten years but deforestation rates are still increasing. So it is clear we do need that widespread action. Um, and one of the important tools that we do have to bring in those that are still doing nothing 
um, is legislation. So there's some proposals for new legislation in the UK, the EU and the US, which I'm sure some of my other panelists will talk about in more detail. But that's why that's so important, requiring all those laggards, uh, companies and institutions to act. Um, so we do need those proposals to be strengthened in some ways. At the moment, they don't apply to the finance sector um, and also to be implemented. But I think it's, it's worth also reiterating that there will be there will need time to be implemented and for the impacts to be felt. So we need voluntary action in the meantime. So that is why it is promising to see, you know, renewed and new commitments coming out of COP26. But definitely we need to make sure that those commitments are followed through, um, that those that make those commitments are starting immediately and implementing them effectively. Um, but also that, that we and others hold those uh, organizations accountable, not, and not only those that have signed to actually implement them, but all the other organizations that are exposed and haven't signed and haven't started this. We still do need to put pressure on them to act voluntarily. Excellent, Sarah, that was that was good. I forgot to say that we're giving you a very strict two minutes, which you stayed within, Sarah, which is really good. Um, but yeah, we're gonna give all our panelists two minutes just to add a little bit of adrenaline so they can't uh, they can't can't you know fill up the our limited airtime. But uh, next, let's go to Forest Five Hundreds Emma Thompson. For you, Emma, um, what do you think? Why why is isn't enough being done? Why are companies not being more ambitious? And you're it's a great to... question. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of we have seen in the Forest Five Hundred that there are some leading companies and financial institutions that are acting, they are setting policies, they are implementing them on the ground. But as we found this year and in the past eight years of Forest 500 assessments, the majority aren't doing that effectively. So the data is there, the tools are there, and with this new legislation coming in, there will also be that kind of additional pressure coming through to them. But I think for some companies and financial institutions, they don't necessarily identify that deforestation is a tangible risk to them. It's not, they don't recognize it's a financial risk. It's an operational risk in terms of continuing deforesting and contributing to the climate crisis will have knock on effects on how well these soft commodities that we're talking about can be grown and harvested and it'll have knock on effects on that. And also what we're really seeing is that consumer pressure and reputational risk really coming in. It's been there for palm oil for quite a while, but it's really coming in from other commodities now too. So I think it is all really coming together as a really 2022 being a great year for action. I think 2021 really laid down the foundation for kind of system change and change across the deforestation economy. And we're now getting to a point where that motivation and the ambition is there. And although we haven't seen that translate into this year's assessments and results, hopefully next year we will see that change coming through. Excellent, thank you very much indeed. And get, you know, very nice and crisp. Emma, that was really good. Um, Neil Parrish uh, of uh, uh, the UK Parliament, MP in the UK Parliament. Neil, um, I mean, I don't want to lead you. This is your free to comment as you wish on this. Uh, and the, the subject, of course, is why is not enough being done? But obviously, there are little hints that there should be more legislation. Where do you stand on that? I mean, you take it yourself, but I wouldn't mind knowing where you stand on that, if you're happy to comment on that. The answer is yes, we do need, and I've been pressing for it, and I put amendments down to the Environment Bill, and I'm in continuing to do so. So what I'll do, Justin, you talked about enough adrenaline. I think um, there's enough adrenaline in Parliament um, at the moment. So um, just really to, to follow Sarah and, and Emma is that, the, um, the deforestation, we need a, a due diligence requirement on big banks. The main thing I want to see is more public awareness of this issue, because the, the more people know about it, the more likely you are, we are to see change. I have been pushing for a due diligence obligations on the banks over the last 12 months. It has a, I had an amendment down on the Environment Bill when it was in the Commons uh, that would compel banks to make sure they are not funding money into big agribusinesses which illegally deforest land. We had a Westminster Hall debate on deforestation in the Amazon last week, and I named and shamed some UK banks that are doing this, which shows just why legislation is needed. Internationally, you've got JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, and the Bank of China, among others, are taking almost $2 billion in profit uh, in the last five years directly from financing deforestation. We have big UK banks like HSBC, Santander, and Barclays, all investing in companies carrying out large-scale deforestation. HSBC is a worst offender on this. Global Witness 
have done some very good work and they conducted a study which showed that AC, a, HSBC provided about seven billion dollars worth of finance to companies destroying forests in the last five years. The government said that my amendment wasn't necessary because banks would voluntarily put a stop to this, but we are not seeing this and then this is not the case. I questioned the Prime Minister about this in a liaison committee session uh, recently where we discussed the voluntary commitments made by some companies at COP26 to stop illegal deforestation land. He said there was about 40 banks who signed up to the Glasgow Declaration on Forest and Land Use. But I have since written to him asking him to clarify because I have looked into it and no UK bank actually signed up. So the failure of British banks such as HSB to sign up to even voluntary commitments shows that the government regulation of banks is needed properly to address this issue. Um, that's not to mention the fact that those who did sign are doing so voluntarily and so essentially nothing happens if they fail to meet their targets. This is where we need to really put it, this into the public domain for people to change their their banks. People need to know how their money is being spent. So if we use a particular bank or pension fund, then customers, we need to know, let them know where their money is being used for. And then just finally, uh, right. more than one third of the Amazon carbon is stored in indigenous ter territories in Brazil. And these um, indigenous peoples need to be protected not only for the environment, but for their themselves as well. So thank, thank you. I'm sorry if I went on a little bit longer. No, you were fine. You were like 15, 20 seconds too long. That's all. That's that's very modest. No, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Lara but but Burkhart, sorry. Uh of uh, uh a uh, member of the European Parliament. Delara, are you there? Yes, um now I stabilized my connection. I'm sorry, it's very no, bad. no problem at all. No, we can see you very can hear you very clearly. Delara, yes. why is not enough being done? Your two minutes starts now. Why is not it enough to be done? Well, um, I mean, we have seen a lot of voluntary commitments in the past. So a lot of self commitments by saying we want to be deforestation free in X, X, up, uh, X Y, but um, we haven't seen so much concrete action. And I think um, it, it has different reasons. I, I know, of course, we are on the one hand dealing with very complex supply chains in that sense, but we also see that there is not enough being done within uh, the financial institutes and also in the companies to trace back the origin of, of, the, um, of the commodities they are using or um, maybe worse, also not looked at what is happening on the ground. And I think um, what we need for that is not, again, voluntary commitments to follow or some labels or certification schemes that leave the, the responsibility to decide for a deforestation free product um, with the consumer. I mean, we all know that it's too late when you're standing in front of the supermarket seeing, um, deciding by a label that um, then the deforestation in the worst uh, case already happened. So what I think, and I really uh, can agree with Neil Parrish on that point, what we need is mandatory due diligence to to make a, to in a legislative context to to um, oblige p um, companies and financial institutes to deal with those kinds of commodities to trace back and to make transparent their supply chains in order to 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 have a um, really um, all the commitments and self um, commitments being something um, followed and I'm very happy that on the European level we are already. Uh, as European Parliament, we're able to push the Commission to make a proposal uh, to an anti-deforestation law on the European level, where we will introduce mandatory due diligence. This was something that was not granted when we started the process. Um, two years ago, I was the Rapporteur of the European Parliament. The Commission was taking into account uh, instruments like um, labels, certification schemes, which would have left the responsibility to the consumer. And now we are discussing a mandatory due diligence. Right now in the proposal of the commission, financial institutes are not yet included. I think we have to change that, but this is what we are working on right now within the European Parliament. Delara, just a little bit over there, so I'm going to stop you there, but there will be more opportunities to talk because that's all very interesting. And this issue of mandatory, mandatory due diligence is obviously potentially central to all of this. Um, so it'd be great to hear Vermund Olsen of uh, Storebrand Asset Management, the Norwegian company. Um, it'd be good to hear from you, uh, uh, Vermund, uh, what you think of that, or you know, take it wherever you want. Why are other companies not doing enough on this crucial issue of deforestation, Vermund? 
Well, I, I would agree that uh, mandatory due diligence regulations is a, is a key part. Uh, I think financial institutions should be included. I think that even, even just including companies, that will also drive more action from financial institutions because it will, it will drive the transparency and traceability of supply chains, which the voluntary commitments have not succeeded in doing uh, fast enough. Um, Within the financial sector, I would say that the, I think that there has been much more attention on uh, on uh, emissions from uh, from fossil fuels. I mean, there has been a big divestment movement from coal. There are lots of uh, different engagement initiatives on uh, on on fossil fuels. And while a lot of uh, investors also have worked on deforestation, it's fair to say that it hasn't been with the same amount of resources and and attention. Uh, so I think that hopefully 2021 can be an inflection point. We have a group of more than 30 investors committing to attempting to be deforestation free by 2025, us among them. Uh, and there has uh, also been much more attention to the links between climate and nature in, in, in general. You know, there was the much more focus on nature risk at Glasgow and, and this year we'll have the the, the the cop of the convention on biological diversity so i i do um, i feel optimistic for 2022 excellent that's very good that was admirably short and concise thank you very much indeed and finally let's go to sebastian Sol soliel is Soleil. that Soleil. Soleil, like the sun, uh, from BMP Paribas, which is uh, which is rated very highly uh, in the Forest 500. Um, Sebastian, uh, why are other institutions not following your lead yet? I think the, the first point is data and traceability, because when we want to stop deforestation, OK, we have to discuss with our clients and ask them, OK, what are your suppliers? and where do the products your suppliers buy come from? And uh, it's for the supplier of, uh, of um, grade one, grade two, grade three, and uh, until the, the, the local farmers. And this process takes a lot of time. It's quite complex because this is, uh, our clients are not completely aware of this. Uh, some of them are, some of them are not enough aware of this uh, uh, issue. So yes, it's a long process to discuss with all the clients uh, to make sure that they are not involved in deforestation. So data traceability discussion with the clients is quite complex. Um, to make it uh, easier, I think it's very important to create collective actions because if all the financial institutions ask the same thing to their clients, it will be much easier both for us and for our clients. And there is a deep issue of local, uh, local regulation as well, because if everywhere in the world, there would be no, uh, no legal deforestation uh, and no illegal either. It would be much easier. But the problem is in many countries, uh, some deforestation is uh, allowed by the law. And even if it's illegal, uh, local governments don't do what they have to do to, to, to forbid uh, deforestation. So yes, we need really global coalitions. We need uh, regulations. So local regulation and uh, uh, regulation, uh, yes, mandatory due diligence, why not, if it's possible, these kind of things. And uh, we need as well to raise awareness among uh, stakeholders, so both citizens, politicians, and, and companies. And in the end, we need global actions to make sure that we agree on the global target and uh, we agree on the tool to implement collectively uh, the right tools. Excellent. That was very good. And within the time, Sebastian, that's excellent. Listen, we're going to come back to all our panelists to have a, a, a broader discussion. But first, we thought it'd be very useful to hear from Emma Thompson of Forest 500 about the report itself and what it tells us. I had a couple of headline facts at the beginning of this. I mentioned that at COP, there were 30 financial institutions, which you picked up on Vermin there, uh, which, uh, uh, which were with nine billion in assets, nine, sorry, nine trillion of dollars in assets, pledged to use the best efforts to uh, reduce deforestation, in their, to eliminate deforestation from their portfolios by 2025. Yet the Forest 500 report tells us that only four of those are among the 150 companies with the most influence on the sector. So just four of those 30. So we are not seeing, you know, most of the most influential companies stepping forward. Um, and that, I suppose, is what, yeah, yeah, that is, of course, one of the key messages. But Emma, do you want to pick up on that and give me an idea of what, you know, summarize the report for us? Before you do that, do you want to just tell us, 
you know, remind everybody in the audience what Forest 500 is and what its what its kind of uh, mission is in terms of uh, its approach to tackling deforestation. Yeah, of course, thank you. So Forest 500 was started in 2014. So this is our eighth year of assessments. And every two years, we select the 350 companies who have the most exposure to deforestation risk. So that's looking at how, what volume of different commodities they're sourcing, so specifically palm oil, soy, timber, pulp and paper, and beef and leather. And then we also look at the 150 financial institutions that are providing the most finance to those 350 companies. And then every year we assess them on the strength of their deforestation commitments and their commitments on social issues, and then also look at how they're implementing those commitments through their supply chains or portfolios. And we do that all on publicly available information. So. That is a very brief summary of Forest 500. Um, and the logic of that, of course, is that you you highlight the people who are doing it, you rank them, you give an easily yeah. accessible way of kind of working out how, how what they're doing on this. And that hopefully begins to shame them and the people who invest in them to get them to do to take more action. Um, just just before we start, I mean, how effective mm -hmm. have you found that is is over the all oh, what seven years that you've been mm -hmm. uh, running? Yeah, so. A very really key part of Forest 100, as you said, is that accountability side. So we are assessing these companies and institutions against the best practice for the sector. So where they aren't scoring full points, that's a sign that they aren't following that best practice. So that's really the angle that we go about Forest 100 in. It's helping to hold them accountable to the commitments they've made, but also really showing a very digestible way of exactly this is the next step you can take. This is what you need to be doing. And so it's kind of that holistic approach. And we have had a lot of engagement from companies and financial institutions. And even though the data was only launched today, we've already had, I would say, more engagement in the past few years from companies and institutions today alone, um, wanting to hear more about their assessment and our methodologies. So I think- But really Emma, you say that they're engaging, they're wanting to talk to you about it. You've created this pathway and mm -hmm. this opportunity to highlight when they're not doing the right thing. And yet, your report is telling us that the, re the, you know, the action is kind of woefully uh, slow and, uh, mm -hmm. and ineffective. So what is, give summarize the key findings of the report if you could. Yeah, definitely. So to kind of summarize what I've already said, these 500 that we're talking about are the companies and financial institutions who have the most power to completely transform supply chains of palm oil, soy, cutter products and timber products. They have the most exposure and the most influence and that also means they have the most influence to contribute to the climate crisis and how deforestation contributes to that. But just to kind of put that into a bit of perspective as well, I just want to share a few slides um, quickly. So as you should be able to see, these 150 financial institutions are putting $5.5 trillion of financing into these 350 companies alone. That's roughly the equivalent of the UK GDP. So this is the kind of money we're talking about and this is how influential these stakeholders and players that we're talking about are. So with that in mind, the findings of this report are really disappointing. So if we look first at the whole picture, so 210. Sorry, Emma, I'm, we can't see the slides. Could you try oh, stop and sharing again? So, yeah, apologies for no, that. No, I was gonna say, I wasn't sure whether it was just me. I was just texting the, uh, the, uh, the host. Has that worked? Out. Yeah, that's better. Apologies for that. So that slide was just 5.5 trillion. So what we're really seeing is minimal progress. So the 210 of the 500 haven't made a single deforestation policy this year. So that's 210 have not covered any of their sourcing, their financing with a deforestation policy. And so this is only five less than last year. So we have seen a very marginal improvement, but it is really negligible. And then looking at, I hope it's going to carry on sharing. I think so. Looking at companies in particular, so really focusing in on those, a third of the companies with the most exposure to tropical deforestation still haven't set a single deforestation policy for any of their commodities that they're using. And only 28% of those assessed have set a policy for every commodity that they're using. So and just to really be clear, means, if uh -huh. I may jump in, sorry, just yeah, to be clear, when it. you talk about these commitments they're making, you mm -hmm. are not depending on them to engage with you. You're, you're going into their... Uh, accounts and looking at what commitments they publicly made. Exactly. So this, you're interrogating their public statements about what their intentions are rather than relying on them coming to you. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So this is all publicly available and they're public commitments. And so what this 
what we're seeing is that this means huge proportions of global commodity sourcing are not covered by deforestation policies. So they're vulnerable to that deforestation and setting these commitments is the first step companies can take to address these risks. And then if we look at financial institutions, it's a really similar picture, definitely a bit worse. So this year, well, ninety proportion, very slightly mm -hmm. higher proportion in, have already made yeah. commitments. Yeah, but so 93 don't have any deforestation policies at all. Oh, those are the ones without any? Yeah, yeah. without any. So yeah. what this translates to is that of that 5.5 trillion that I was talking about, $2.6 trillion of that financing, which is roughly half of the, and no, sorry, roughly equal to the UK GDP, is going into the forest 500 companies, so those that are most exposed to deforestation, and that money isn't covered by a policy. So those companies aren't being required to address deforestation in their supply chains because the financial institutions haven't assessed those, haven't imposed those commitments. So it's a really negative picture, but if I can just take it a bit further and I'll stop showing my slide for this. Um, so Global Canopy defines a really strong deforestation policy as one that includes no deforestation, no conversion of natural ecosystems, but also commitments around labor rights, the free prior informed consent of indigenous peoples and local communities, and also uh, commitments around land use conflict. And what we've seen this year is that none of the companies or financial institutions, none of those 500 have equivalent policies to that standard for all of their commodities. And in fact, only seven companies have it for even one of their commodities. So what we're seeing there is that it's not only inaction from the companies and financial institutions that haven't made commitments, but also the leaders aren't aligned with that best practice either. Um, I have to say that runs a bit counter to your kind of loads of companies are coming to us and engaging with us. Um, you know, there, there is obviously, as, as your report says, a hell of a lot, long way to go. What, I mean, summarise for us br very briefly, what, what would your agenda for action be? What could be done about this? Yeah, so I would like to clarify, we are seeing more engagement. And I think it's a really clear sign of the amount of momentum that 2021 has really built on this issue. And so I think it is really promising for the future. But in terms of the recommendations for how this can improve and how we can fix this issue, we have kind of three top line recommendations. So firstly, we want to see governments build on the progress that they've made at Glasgow uh, with the Glasgow Declaration and then also this due diligence legislation that we've spoken about. We want to see that set and implemented effectively, but really importantly, we want to see that being strengthened and covering financial institutions as well. That's really vital. But we recognize that that legislation will not be instantly implemented. It will take a few years to get to the point where it's being implemented. So what we really need to see from the companies and financial institutions is that they step up to the plate now. They start making commitments if they haven't already, and they really focus on implementing them effectively on the ground. We haven't got the time to wait for that legislation to come in before we start acting. There are the planets at stake, lives, livelihoods, and we just really need that process to start now. And then finally, the civil society does a really crucial role here in holding these companies and financial institutions to account. The accountability community has been doing this for many years, and it's really just continuing that, but particularly focusing on those that have still not set any commitments or policies at all and really bringing them up to match kind of where we well, yeah, level the playing field, really. That is excellent. No, thank you very much indeed for that. That gives us a clear outline of the agenda that we need to address in this. I'd like to bring back our panel, if we may, to discuss some of these issues. I'd like to remind our audience out there that you're welcome. We encourage you to ask questions. This is your opportunity to kind of interrogate our, plan our panel and, uh, and ask anything that you want to. Uh, I'm ha quite happy. To, to kind of own them if you like, but you can jump in and tell us what you like, uh, ask the questions that you want. We've already got a couple of questions in, so I'll start with those, I think. Let me just quickly, I'm just trying to read. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's a really good question. I'm not sure who this is. Do I know who this is from, host? I don't think I do. The first question is about um, this mandatory due diligence. Um, and the question is, you know, it you can easy to see how in countries like the UK, Europe, the US, it may be possible to hold companies to account for mandatory due diligence. 
But um, how do you begin to engage Asia, which is obviously one of the biggest sources of one of the biggest consumers of palm and soy, and also, of course, home to some of the most uh, egregious deforestation. So um, panelists, do you want to raise your hands or should we go? Let us go to Neil. Let's start with you, Neil. Um, you talked about the importance of mandatory due diligence. Um, how on earth, do you, fine in the UK, you know, you can see how that might have traction. How are you going to how are you going to engage companies and uh, countries and companies in places like Asia and, of course, in South America? Yeah, I mean, I think we do actually by concentrating on those companies that are supplying them finance, much of the finance, you know, coming through Western banks and the like. Um, I think we can actually have a lot of influence. Now, what we can't influence is the government of the day. You know, you've got a government in Brazil which says one thing at COP26 and behaves slightly differently on the ground um, in the Amazon rainforest for the indigenous population. So, you know, I'm, I'm quite outspoken, as you as, as you probably know, Justin. I do. So. You know, we, we do have to, and that's why I think this idea with, with Forest 500, with uh, Global Witness and many others, um, actually drilling down on the financial institutions then puts pressure, because if they can't get the, basically the heart won't beat if you don't give it blood, basically, let's be blunt. And so therefore, like I said, keep, the, keep squeezing the finance. And that's where governments, I think, will need to um, actually bring in legislation. And in the meantime, as it takes time, as, as Emma was talking about, then I think we've got time for those financial institutions to clean up their act. Um, they will also want, I would have thought, the investors, more investors will be more, F, uh, they will be much more keen to, to put their money um, where this deforestation is not happening. Um, and so that's why it's key to work. And I think we work on the governments of other nations and, and across the world uh, through the financial institutions because they do need money. But, um, you know, if, I mean, you know, that kind of presumes, Neil, I don't want to accuse you of being, uh, you know, uh, biased towards the Western world, but that assumes that there isn't money available to fund these kind of operations within Asia itself. Of course, Asia is now a huge global economy. There are lots of financial institutions there. And, and it kind of feels to me as if, you know, there should be a kind of moral argument as well. I want to throw this open wider. Neil, give me a very brief response and then let me go. To I, you, you, you make a fair point, Dustin. There, there's a, a very large economy, is there not, in, in, the, in the Far East, which can fund a lot of this. And so that's why, you know, the, the COP26 and, and bringing global pressure and bringing everybody into the tent, even if they're not particularly cooperative, is always got to be right uh, because there is other finance to be found. So, but I still think, you know, with our own own banks and those that we have influence over we could still do a lot of squeezing and I think we can get the public on our side and I think that will bring the banks more likely on 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 the right side of this argument rather than the wrong well we have a representative of the uh financial institution a very large financial institution Sebastian Sol Sebastian Solier of BNP Paribas. Sebastian, you know, squeeze the finance, says Neil, and you can see that there is logic to that, but there's a limit to what we can achieve with that. How would you take, how would you go beyond that? You're already trying to do that within your, the companies that you're in, you're involved in financing. How would you take it beyond uh, Western finance? Uh, yes, it's a very tricky question because we can do things, we try to do things, but Yes, we cannot. Uh, there, are, there are very big banks in China, and it's very difficult to have a, an action on them. So we can show the way, so show that things are possible, and that we can implement things in terms of de deforestation, and hope that the global uh, pressure from everywhere, from the citizens everywhere, will will make sure that yes, there's a, grow, a growing pressure on all the actors, and we have to keep in mind that uh, deforestation in Asia have can have very uh, deep impact in Asia on uh, life quality and this kind of things. Um, so in the end, we can hope that uh, the, what we do in the Western countries, uh, what we do positively, hopefully, uh, and global pressure everywhere can influence as well uh, Asian companies. But it's yes, it's a tricky point. It's a, a tricky point. 
Good. Let, let me move on with a slightly different a nuanced uh, a, a, another question we've got in talking about due diligence. I'd like to go with this one to Vermund Olsen of Storbrand, the Norwegian company. Uh, Vermund, uh, a questioner says, how will these mandatory due diligences be enforced? How does one enforce uh, mandatory due diligence in a way that would be effective, would change behaviour. I go to you not because not because I'm suggesting that you're evading uh, your uh, commitments to due diligence on the issue, but just as a as a corporate uh, a representative of the corporate sector, how might a mandatory due diligence work? Well, perhaps the question would better be uh, be placed to Delara, who's involved with the development of the European due diligence. But I thought uh, it might be what... nice to get a company to yeah. talk about what you thought might change behaviour. You're more a consultant. Imagine this. I'm so, happy to know, answer. Um, yeah. Storbrand uh, isn't as, as forward thinking as it is, and you're a bit reluctant to introduce this. What would induce you to take mandatory due diligence seriously? What do, what do governments need to do? And then let's see whether Delara thinks she's got the, uh, the muscle to get it through the European uh, Parliament. Well, at Storbrand, uh, we're advocating uh, due diligence for, uh, for all companies that, that we invest in, in terms of human rights and in terms of an environment. You know, it's really important that the companies that, for us to be able to assess how well the companies are performing in terms of nature risk, climate risk, human rights risk, it's essential that we know where they operate, that there is transparency about their supply chains. And in specifically in terms of deforestation, the key challenge for us to assess how exposed we are and the companies we invest in are exposed to deforestation is, you know, can they trace the commodities that they produce or use all the way to the point of production? And I think that's the key element of, of uh, mandatory or voluntary due diligence even, that companies are actually able to, to, to provide some clarity and shine a spotlight on, on who they're sourcing from. That, that moment is, is effective due diligence but how do you how do you, what would it take to get companies i mean you must work with some companies who are less enthusiastic about delivering this information to you what do you do i mean like, i suppose for you it's quite easy you say listen we're not going to give you any money unless you can demonstrate that you know how to do this that you can do this in a in a way that's convincing but 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 how do you how do you get the laggards involved what i mean is it fines is it uh, is it kind of some way of 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 closing down access to finance what what would be the the tool that you think would get people to take this seriously well what we do we're an asset management so uh, asset manager so what we do is invest other people's money in uh, in in shares in companies so we're not and we're not a bank not a commercial bank that lend to companies so what we can do is to uh, we can use our, our voting rights as a shareholder at companies. We can uh, file resolutions uh, asking companies to uh, to improve on their traceability, transparency, etc. We did that with the, the soy trader Bungie Limited last year. We engage with the company management and boards and uh, and and say that these are our expectations. We expect you to expect you to comply with them within a, a certain amount of, of time. And at the, as a last resort, uh, we can divest the companies. But of course, when we divest the company, we will sell the shares to someone else. Mm. So it's always a balancing act there. You know, will, will potential new owners be more or less effective than we are in trying to, uh, to convince the companies to, to improve? And that's why we, we always try to collaborate with other invest like-minded investors so that we can increase our leverage over these companies uh, and uh, have, have a larger uh, sort of a shareholder pool that can send the same signals to companies to, uh, to make them improve. So Delara, we've heard there um, how effective financial institutions can be. They, have, they do have a number of kind of sticks they can beat the companies that they're involved with into kind of complying and, and, and showing that they're doing um, their, their due diligence, they're tracing back to origin and can show the impact they're having on the various issues that we're talking about. Um, do you think you can bring effective legislation in? And, and let me just chuck in a I'm sorry about this, but we've got a question in talking about social exploitation, for particularly for indigenous people. Um, you know, how can you ensure, for example, that those additional kind of obligations are are, are acted upon? 
I mean, very much really showed that it's possible um, for financial institutes if there is um, industry always told me it's called a level play field. If there's a level play field for everyone to have the same rules and to have the same rules they have to follow when they um, go and uh, um, fulfill their due diligence uh, responsibilities. So it's about a level playing field that we as legislators have to define. And I think clearer, clearer have to define than it happened in the past. So we have the, the luck, lucky situation we have. We're having an example of um, due, due diligence legends already in place, which is the so-called EU timber regulation, which focused on timber and, and um, due diligence obligation connected to that. And we were seeing uh, by analyzing um, the, the effects of it, that, that the, the different implementation in the different member states was the problem, because in every member state, there was a different uh, way on how the due diligence obligation had to be fulfilled. And I think this is the um, big um, advantage we have for putting this new up on the European scale, where I think we have to be more concrete as legislators. We have to have a, a common definition of what we actually call deforestation free. Should we also maybe also include other valuable ecosystem because we know examples like the Cerrado that their pressures are only shifting to other valuable ecosystems. So we have to have a clear definition about what we are talking. And we have to have stricter traceability obligation for operators and also giving more guidelines to the different member states on how this should be checked on a on a on a bureaucratic uh, level so how um ministries who check on it have to be um, organized and how they have to which resources have to be put in place to also help um, actors from the economy to to fulfill those obligations um, and I think also and this is connected to the social question um, we need a, me a mechanism for for su sustained concerns by third parties so what is happening when we have a cocoa farmer um, who sees that um, some um, some European company is fine um, is um, is um, encouraging deforestation on the ground? Do indigenous peoples have the right to also ask um, or challenge the the question? Um, if European companies have behaved well and due to the laws. Um, so this is also the, the question of accountability and also having access to European courts to, um, to make sure that due diligence um, obligations are fulfilled in the ground. So this is, I think, um, something we have to work on. We have to have the question of inspection levels, who, um, when, how often, etc. cetera, who is um, observing that due diligence is also really um, taken seriously. So this is everything. Uh, a few examples how we can as legislators make concrete um, um, a concrete framework to make it easier for everyone to have the same level playing field and not being a, um, a, a, a thing that is organized freely and everyone is doing it differently because we then know that um, there will be loopholes um, to, to have um, differentiation still be financed. So I think this is a very crucial point uh, where I think all the free, uh, the voluntary commitments have shown that if we don't have a common framework, how we define deforestation free and how we define the obligations of due diligence that we won't have um, De progress in that sense. Delara, that was great. That was very comprehensive and lots to chew on there. But I would like to kind of interject the discussion at the moment with a, an audience poll that we've got. Um, and this is so we want you all kind of hover your fingers hovering over your keyboards to answer this question for us. And this will feed into the discussion as it develops. If you could choose one, which of the those items listed below would be the most powerful in helping companies or financial institutions reduce deforestation in their products or their portfolios? You've got one choice. Is it collaboration across the supply chain, consumer pressure, divestment? or regulation. So you can all see and read the poll there. Do please answer the poll. We'll come back in a moment. Obviously, the magic of digital technology allows us to get that poll up very quickly. But in the meantime, I've got a couple of um, questions coming in. I'm feeling a bit guilty because the questions are silting up in our inbox and I need to, I need to get them out there. So Gillian Mollod, uh, asks, uh, you know, says, can you address the fact that there were well over 100 countries committed to halt or re reverse deforestation by 2030? That pledge made at COP26 that I mentioned earlier. Can you talk about the limitations of these pledges? I think this goes to uh, Forest 500. Um, uh, can you talk about the limitations of these pledges as well as the term reverse as deforestation in many areas 
cannot be reversed. Emma, do you want to pick that up? Emma, you know, how serious are those commitments? Is this concept of reversing deforestation realistic? Yeah, so Forest 500 only assesses companies and financial institutions on their commitments to stop deforesting and not about conservation and restoration. We do look at that, but we don't score it in our indicators. And so speaking at the country level, um, I think the commitments that were made, it was a huge improvement. The fact that 141, 90% of tropical forests are covered. And I think, you know, I think it's very clear that there is a lot to be seen in how that's implemented. Are community rights, indigenous rights respected within that? What does it look like in reality? And I think all of that is still yet to come to the fore, but I think it's a really promising start, especially compared to previous commitments like the New York Declaration on Forests, which was great, but we didn't see as much progress as we hoped. And I think that all of these countries committing to it and hopefully keeping that momentum from COP and all the financial institutions and companies acting too, I think we will just kind of have to see how it goes, but I think it is really promising. Good. I'm glad. Nice to have a positive message. Um, uh, Sarah Draper, could you take this one, please? Dewe Wulan Sari says, we've talked about the pressure that the financial institutions can put on companies. What about incentives? Are there any incentives that we can, that we can you know, dangle in front of them that will uh, encourage them to, to take more action on this issue? Where, where do you stand on that? That's yeah, def definitely. I think I think there is uh, there is the kind of more positive angle, and certainly there's also seeing um, the opportunities that the financial institutions have as well in uh, encouraging companies to be more sustainable and you know seeing more um, perfor greater performance from sustainable companies, particularly over the last year or so. Um, so yeah, the, I mean, there's kind of more. Um, yeah, exactly as you say kind of more positive examples that they can use with their financing so uh, providing more favorable rates for instance um but so i think it's definitely one that that is an option i'd love to hear uh Berman, sebastian's kind of ideas or if they've got any examples that they've been using um, but i think it definitely there's there's a two-pronged approach that can be taken right it's reducing risk but also uh taking advantage of some of the opportunities that are posed as well Berman, do you want to pick up on that? You know, what do you think? How do you how effective do you think it's been? And obviously, there's a balance here. On the one hand, you create an environment where it's embarrassing for companies and financial institutions to be linked with deforestation. That actually does create an incentive to become involved because you've got a you've got a more positive public image. I mean, is that is that is that kind of that? I mean, in a way, is it kind of negative thing? But is that effective? Do you think, um, uh, Berman? If we go to you and then quite quickly go to Sebastian for an answer from him as well. Well, there's a reputational risk, of course, of being linked to deforestation, but there are also in many cases, you know, huge operational risks. We see already that droughts in Brazil are, are impacting on the on the agricultural output of the of the soy industry, for instance. So so raising the awareness of companies of the, the, the large nature related risk that they're exposed to, that's one 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 side. Let me no, just no, no, quickly no. jump in there, because are they the problem often in these situations is they're different companies. So the risks fall unevenly across the uh, across the kind of corporate sphere. That's a very good point. And uh, and uh, you could still divest every company with any link to to deforestation and still be exposed to deforestation risk in, in that sense. And that's part of that is why why Stuart Grand and a lot of other investors are through the investor policy uh, dialogue on deforestation are sort of engaging the authorities in Brazil and Indonesia to create the kind of level playing field that Delara talks about. I mean, you, it's, we have to engage with companies, but we also have to engage with, with governments to show that the financial sector and the broader business sector uh, you know, needs a strong regulation to protect uh, natural resources, to create the level, uh, that kind of level playing field. Excellent. Sebastian, do you want to jump in? Are there any thoughts that you can add add to that? And then I think we'll go to yes. um, I think we'll go to the poll results. Yes, and the positive side, what we can do as a financial institution, what we do is uh, propose to our clients, provide our clients with financial products and services more attractive and dedicated to biodiversity. So we concluded a lot of uh, green bond deals or uh, sustainable linked loans deal with target or user forces focus on biodiversity. And so it's um, financial services that are more attractive for our clients and positive for biodiversity when the target and the user forces are carefully designed 
to make sure that he has a target, he is clearly related to uh, the fight against, uh, against deforestation or the preservation of biodiversity. So yes, we are developing more and more, and we have much more to develop. We are developing more and more uh, yes, financial services dedicated to biodiversity to help our, cl our clients in their uh, fight against, uh, against deforestation. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sebastian. I've news in, hot news in on the on the uh, on the on our little text box that we're sharing here. The results are in on the poll. It's come up there. If you could choose one, remember was the question: <clears throat> which of the below would be the most powerful in helping companies or financial institutions reduce deforestation in their products or portfolios? And we see that quarter of you thought collaboration across the supply chain was important. Consumer pressure, I'm really surprised. Just 8% of you thought that was important. Divestment, just 10%. Regulation, overwhelmingly, you find, and there are a big audience here, you find that regulation is the most important thing. And I suppose, you know, let me just quickly jump in. And I'd like to hear kind of what Forest 500, what Emma Thompson has to say about this. There's, you know, so the overwhelmingly, the feeling is that regulation is the most important way to deal with this. Um, it, does that accord with what you think? I would have thought, you know, consumer pressure was very important as well. And of course, divestment, you would have thought would be, you know, we were talking about the, you know, what, what threats would get companies to take action. And obviously divestment, you would imagine was quite important. Although, um, uh, you know, as Vermin pointed out, you know, we sell, sh you know, an institution sells shares to someone else. So you've got to be mindful of what their agenda might be. Um, but pick up on that. How, well, you'll respond, please, to our poll results. Yeah, sure. So I think, yeah, obviously regulation is something that Global Canopy and Forest Funded really does support. It's something that our data has shown. It's been eight years. And the companies and financial institutions that have the most power have continued to make minimal, if not, if any, progress at all. And that's not just on setting the policies, but also really crucially on implementing them. So just so, to be clear, sorry to jump in, mm -hmm. but just to be clear, so you're saying we've seen a changing environment in terms of public opinion. We've seen a changing environment. We see it here with the representatives that we've got here with Sebastian and Vermont. We've seen a change in the, the approach of financial institutions, mm -hmm. at least some of them. And yet you're saying we're not seeing a change on the ground. So it's you, really what you're saying is it's time for governments to get tough and start to enact legislation. Yeah, so I think that is really key, but it is also key that financial institutions that aren't yet acting really do step up and start to look at their financing and use the power that they have to do that. We have earlier, oh, sorry, later last year, we launched a finance sector roadmap to eliminate deforestation. Um, and in there, we really focus on the power of financial institutions and how they can engage with companies. So really, you know, and tied to that divestment point, it's really important that financial institutions engage and bring companies with them. Because as Venman said, they can, if they divest, it just leaves that company open to other investment from other less scrupulous investors. So it's kind of a combination of regulation, strong and well implemented policies from companies and financial institutions. Right. OK, I hear that. Sarah Draper, do you want to just jump in and give us your views on that? Are you surprised by the results? Is that what you'd expect? Um, uh, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think I think that is pretty much what what I was expecting. I think just to, to compliment and add to what Emma was saying, Definitely consumer pressure does help, um, but a lot of the, the leaders that are trying to act uh, on, in their supply chains already are those that are most exposed to consumer pressure. So they're the brands that we recognize that are being, yeah, are being kind of targeted with campaigns and things. Um, but all the companies that are not yet acting, a lot of the financial institutions are not yet acting, are those that are less familiar. So consumer pressure isn't getting to them. So I think that's one of the reasons that we do now see a focus on some of the other tools, um, financial sector pressure and legislation to get those companies moving. And then just to agree on with what Vermin said and what you said as well on the divestment, you know, there, there will be other financial institutions that will have less scrupulous policies that might come in. So definitely we encourage you know, organizations to stay involved and engage and try and move companies to improve uh, rather than kind of immediately divesting from those that are lagging behind. Right, we're approaching the end of uh, our session here. I think it's been absolutely fascinating. It's certainly been eye-opening for me. We covered a lot of ground here, and I thought the poll was really useful in kind of guiding us where you, the audience, think um, that this uh, this whole discussion should be going. And I, you know, I'd like again. I mean, uh, you, what, what I've been asked to do is give everybody a minute to summarize their position. I'd like to feed in a thought there because I often, you know, I, I want to come back to that 141 countries at COP 
who said they were going to take action to try and you know reduce and reduce and as we heard in one of the questions reverse although that's a kind of slippery concept uh deforestation in their territories 141 countries out of what about 190 countries on earth uh 90 of forest cover that's pretty good and if we if we as a kind of community are saying you know we need regulation then you know the engagement of those company those countries is important it's also the fact that they've made the a, a, a commitment does to a certain extent you know involve a certain amount of accountability we can go back to them you know as journalists as as uh, as as pressure groups as as uh, as institutions and say look you know you said you were going to do something about this where's the action and hopefully it does that is a spur to introduce some kind of legislation on, on their part. So it, with that as a kind of backdrop, if you like, you know, taking a slightly positive slant on this, I would like to ask our panelists um, to say what they think they would like to see in the next year. What action over the next year would really make a difference? What do they hope will happen? Let's start, Sebastian, with you, BNP Paribas. What do you think uh, would be, and you've got a minute for this, we're cutting your time down. What would you like to see to see real action globally on deforestation? Yes, I will give only one example in one minute. So I think one thing, one thing that is very important in terms, for instance, of accountability, we need a global and common and transparent and robust framework for disclosures. That was, that's why we think that the work of the TNFD, the first and natural and financial disclosure, is very important among many, many other coalitions, but we need a common framework to make sure that companies and financial institutions are able to disclose their uh, uh, biodiversity related risk and opportunities to show to all the stakeholders what they do, what they don't do, what are the risks and the dependencies. And on this basis, it will be much easier for uh, political leaders, for you journalists, or any, all the stakeholders to have a clear opinion of what is being done and what should be done, what should be done more and or less. So yes, disclosure, common framework, I think it's very important. Oh my goodness, that was absolutely spot on one minute and a really good point, I think, because unless you've got a common basis, you can't make comparisons and then you can't, you know, you can't make adequate uh, kind of regulatory responses. So I think that is an important point. Vermund, uh, where, where do you want to uh, take this store brand asset management? Your minute starts now. What do you want to see in 2022? I think for investors like us to, to properly be able to address uh, deforestation, we need better data. But, uh, but as, as has been shown by Forest 500 and Global Camp is that although we don't have perfect data now in terms of traceability of supply chains, we can go a long way with what's available. And that's why I think Forest 500 is, is useful. And I'm glad to see that they've you know, improve their methodology and to give more weight to performance and not just uh, policy quality. Because we have a, a long list of companies that we've selected on the basis of Forest 500 that we want to engage with. But most of the information is sort of on, you know, how well do, are their policies on paper? But what we want the companies to report on is, you know, how, how much of the commodities that they actually source or produce are verified deforestation free. So it's, uh, I'm really glad to see uh, the, the increased focus on performance. Excellent, that was very good. Sebastian, you stayed within the time, you'll be glad to know. And I think what we'll do next, I'll take this to, uh, to Sarah and Emma, to Global Canopy and Forest 500, because what we're hearing from the financial institutions is that we need better, we need comparable data, we need better data, we need companies to be showing what's actually happening within their supply chains, um, delivering data that you know really is meaningful rather than just uh, you know waving an armful of, of 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 aspirations within their annual report. So uh, you know. To what extent, because I mean, this is very much your area, is disclosing this kind of information. Sarah Draper of Global Canopy. Sarah, what will you be doing? It's getting a bit more urgent now. What will you be doing to improve the data that Vermin and Sebastian have in order to make decisions about investments? And your time starts now. Thanks, Justin. So, I mean, we, as, as Emma has said, we do review our methodologies each year and keep Kind of pushing towards that best practice. Uh, we're also uh, involved with partners on kind of defining what are the metrics we want companies to be reporting to show really clear impacts on deforestation on the ground. Um, so we're working with them on that and, and moving and adding those into our assessments. 
Um, we're also working on a project called Aligned Accountability to bring our Forest 500 data connected up with other uh, related and complementary data sets to make that available to financial institutions in one place. And we're working with a, with a group of financial institutions to, to input into what are the most important metrics for them to be able to factor that into their decision making. Um, so that's kind of all kicking off across this year um, and yeah, keeping to, to improve and push forward on company reporting, definitely part of all that. Oh, do you hear that timing? That was really <laughs> impressive, like to the second, uh, which is a standard, you know, a st a, my own kind of regulatory uh, function, a standard that I hope, Emma, you will uh, uh, stay uh, meet uh, when you address this question. And I'd like to ask a slightly more, if I may, so if you've got a prepared answer, you can throw it away now. Uh, Emma, because I want to ask you a specific question, and that is there's a limit to your approach, and obviously I can see why you do it, you look at publicly available information, that you, you, what we're hearing from the financial institutions, we need to go beyond that, we need to get traceability right down through the supply chain so we can see whether actually there is deforestation within the supply chains of these companies. Is there, Do you have an ambition to become, you know, have a more kind of investigative role beyond, you know, publicly available data? Is that something that's important, or do you feel that you're you know you're kind of doing well enough the way that you approach things now that's for you emma and your time starts now so quite a lot for a minute um i think that the real value of forest 500 is that we do a really in-depth thorough assessment of these 500 with the most influence and yes it is reliable on publicly available information but you can get so much from that information and tying into this legislation the forest 500 and what we look at is although it's not the crucial details of that legislation aren't confirmed, there will be some alignment between our methodology and what they're required to report. So in a way, our methodology is kind of getting these companies and financial institutions ready to report that information, to make those mechanisms, to have that readily available. And I think what's really key about Forest 100 and that reliance on publicly available information is that we are pushing for transparency. Transparency is what is needed to solve this issue, we need it throughout the supply chain and we are really pushing for that by relying on that publicly available information. And we have seen companies and financial institutions publish things on their website because they know that we use publicly available information. And so I think the only way to solve this issue is coming at it from all of those different angles. So I think Forest 500 is obviously, I think a really valuable tool, um, but it's really showing the key trends that we need legislation to address as well. Excellent, and, and yeah, okay. Neil, let's go to you. Neil, I'm, and I'm sort of going up because obviously you, in theory, I know it's not like, it probably doesn't feel like that when you're an MP. In theory, you have the, the, the power to legislate, to take action on this. Uh, we've seen overwhelmingly the audience here are saying they want you to, to act. That's the most effective way to tackle this problem. Um, you know, what are you going to do? What's your agenda for 2022 in terms of pushing forward uh, this issue in the UK? Oh, you've gone quiet. I can't hear you. Um, yep. Let me un unmute. Um, thank you, Justin. Um, yes, I chair the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Select Committee, so that will help me, you know, put pressure through that. And as an individual, clearly, like I said, legislation is needed, but the legislation also that we do needs to be make it stick. And we need to make sure that these companies are transparent. We also, as we get more governments to sign up to stop deforestation, that's got to be properly audited, because at the moment in Brazil, you're still seeing deforestation going on, and yet they've signed up to the 2030 deal. So all the time, uh, it's a combination, I think, of getting legislation in and then getting it out also to the to the consumer, to those that are doing the investing as well, so that they don't put their money into those particular institutions and companies. So if we all work together, I believe we can make it work. And I think today and your chairing of this has been excellent, Justin. So thank that's, you very much. Uh, that's very kind of you, Neil. And you stayed within your time. I'm impressed to see. Um, finally, Delara, let's go to you, because again, coming to you last, because you, in theory, at least have the power to legislate on this. Um, as I said to Neil, you know, we've seen this overwhelming desire to see more regulation as the most effective way to get action on this. Um, you already outlined you have got a, a, an agenda for this. Let me ask you a slightly different question then. 
it's all very well for you to have a really well worked out agenda. How realistic is it? How engaged are other MEPs? How engaged is the European Commission in this? Because obviously Europe, I mean, UK is very important, but Europe uh, you know, has an even bigger uh, impact globally. And uh, you know, if you would take action, that would be very meaningful. Your time, Delara, starts now, your one minute. I have to say at that point, I, I still miss having British colleagues. Um, yes, so um, of course, we already have gone a strong way. So we had the Parliament's initiative 2020, where I was the rapporteur, where we pushed it. And now the Commission made a proposal and it's getting concrete now. So we having the French presidency, the negotiations on the law are starting now. And what we need to do now is to watch out for um, industry lobbies not to water the ambition down which is actually happening and um, um, I, I see there are a lot of industries really engaged in having an ambitious law but there are also um, other parts of the industry that want to see some loopholes in it um, and this is what I think um, is our um, our task as 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 lawmakers having a regulation without loopholes um, and I think it's also in the interest of the industry because more companies in fact should actually see um, that there is a um, that the st strong due diligence regulation against the innovation could uh, really protect our all livelihoods but also their economic basis and create a, a level playing field as I said so I think it's crucial that we act that we don't let what ambition water down because some industries want to want want to make profit of the destruction of nature I don't think this is what the majority of consumers and people want and we have to um, have to make the pressure high on that point and I think um, studies like yours, the reports like uh, the Forest 500 report really help to put also this abstract pictures from burning Amazon forest to the consumption um, we are having in Europe. And I think this is the crucial part that we can relate with it and that we see that our action can make a difference on okay. the ground in the Amazon. So this- Hello, all right. Yeah, that's very useful. Thank you very much indeed for that. And I'd like to pick up on your final thought there, which is that the big message, the big takeaway from this is read the report um, and for companies and financial institutions out there, implement their commitments and policies. So have a look at the report and uh, and see how it applies to your business. See what difference you can make. Can I thank everybody who's been involved, our excellent panelists who've been great and have gone along with my uh, my timekeeping uh, with real gusto and spirit. So that's fantastic. I thought it was really illuminating and interesting. You've been a brilliant audience. I know we always say that, but seriously, there were great questions there. I'm just ashamed that I couldn't get to as many of them as I want. You've been really engaged. You've obviously been really interested in this go away think about what you've heard you can always engage with forest 500 and global canopy they're very keen to hear from you so thank you very much indeed there will be i'm told to tell you more housekeeping there will be a quick survey on your browser do uh, give feedback um, on that uh, and it will shape obviously how we do these things in the future but thank you very much everybody for contributing and as i say the only duty left for you is to read the report thank you very much indeed <laughs>